Nikki Allen, a seven-year-old girl from Sunderland, was brutally murdered in 1992. The culprit lured her to a derelict warehouse where he attacked her. Nikki was beaten with a brick and stabbed 37 times before her body was left in the basement of the old exchange building. Despite initial investigations and the wrongful accusation of another man, it took over 30 years for the perpetrator to be convicted. The case was notable for its circumstantial evidence, including the perpetrator's previous criminal record involving indecent assaults and his misleading statements about his whereabouts on the night of the murder. Nikki Allen was born in 1985 and lived in Sunderland, England. Nikki was a cheerful and well-loved child, known for her playful nature, often seen playing with friends near her home. On October 7, 1992, young Nikki Allen walked home from her grandpa's apartment. It was around 8.30 in the evening. When her mother, Sharon Henderson, got home, Nikki Allen was gone. She could not be found anywhere. Over a hundred neighbors came together to look for her. After a day's search, they discovered Nikki's red shoes and purple coat outside an old abandoned exchange building near her apartment. The search party decided to comb through the derelict building. Soon after, a teenager rushed out of the building in a state of panic. He discovered a body inside. It was Nikki Allen, found inside the exchange building's basement. She had suffered 37 stab wounds and her head was brutally hit with a brick. The Northumbria police thoroughly traced Nikki's path from her grandpa's apartment to her home, combing the streets for evidence. They found an eyewitness who had been at the Boar's Head pub on that crucial night. While playing dominoes and having a beer, this witness saw Nikki walking alongside a man in a white shirt. It seemed she knew him, joyfully skipping to catch up with him. The unexpected tragedy deeply affected everyone in West Garth, including police officers who were accustomed to difficult circumstances. There was a large turnout at Nikki Allen's funeral, and the funeral procession was lengthy and heart-wrenching. Following the burial, the quest to find Nikki's attacker continued. An artist's rendering of the man in the white shirt became a crucial aspect of the investigation. Numerous officers were dedicated to the case. The detectives conducted door-to-door -door inquiries in West Garth to gather leads and seek potential eyewitnesses. Despite the community's familiarity with Nikki, there were no eyewitnesses, except for one neighbor. This individual informed the detectives that he knew Nikki and had seen her that night too. He recalled being at the old exchange building a few days earlier with a young boy, searching for pigeons. The police fixated their efforts on finding the man in the white shirt but they were unable to find any leads for almost a year. Then, in late 1993, George Heron, a young man residing near Nikki Allen's home, was arrested on the suspicion of taking her life. A knife matching the stab wounds was discovered in Heron's home. Blood spatters were also found on his shoes and clothing. Heron's sister informed the police that on the night of the incident, he had an unusual half hour in the bathroom, which was out of character for him. It appears he was washing himself and his clothes. Initially denying being out that evening, for witnesses claimed they saw a man resembling Heron at local pubs where he was seen buying Nikki Allen's favorite, cheese and onion crisps, which police believed he used to entice Nikki into the building. George Heron repeatedly denied any involvement in Nikki's demise over 120 times during questioning. However, as pressure mounted on him, he gradually started making partial admissions. What stood out as particularly shocking was the method by which the police guided him to provide an account that aligned with what they needed to hear. They dropped clues and essentially manipulated him into describing the events in a manner they already knew. There were evident aspects Heron did not know about, yet the police steered him toward those details. After three days of questioning, the police got Heron's confession. Although the evidence against Heron was largely circumstantial, the police were confident in securing a conviction. However, the handling of George Heron became notorious as a significant low point in Northumbria police operations. The case against Heron fell apart when the judge deemed his taped confession inadmissible in court, citing heavy-handed police tactics. Due to this ruling, Heron was found not guilty. He was granted a change of identity and relocated away from Sunderland, England. In 1994, Sharon Henderson, 
the heartbroken mother, initiated a civil lawsuit against Heron, accusing him of battery on a child resulting in her demise. Surprisingly, the court ruled in her favor and instructed Heron to pay her over £7,000. But since Heron's identity and location were changed, he could not be found, leading to the money never being paid. Encountering initial setbacks, the Northumbria police felt embarrassed and reluctant to prosecute anyone without substantial evidence. With this mindset, no additional leads surfaced, and the case went cold for 21 years. In February 2014, cold case detectives revisited the case upon discovering resemblance to the crimes committed by Stephen John Greveson, a serial offender already behind bars. Known as the Sunderland Strangler, Greveson was convicted of strangling four teenage boys in a series of bloodbaths between 1990 and 1994 in Sunderland, England. Even though Nikki Allen was a girl and her cause of demise involved stabbing, the severe blunt force trauma to her head resembled injuries inflicted by Greveson on his victim, Simon Martin, in 1990. Greveson was questioned regarding potential involvement, but detectives later confirmed he would not face immediate action in connection to their ongoing investigation. The Nikki Allen case went cold again for two more years. Then in May 2016, Nikki's mother, Sharon Henderson, demanded a comprehensive reinvestigation of the crime. She initiated an online petition urging Northumbria police to conduct a thorough review of the case. Within less than 24 hours, the petition garnered over 500 signatures. Then, in April 2017, Henderson met with Northumbria Police Chief Constable Steve Ashman and Detective Chief Inspector Lisa Theaker. They reaffirmed their commitment to bring Nikki's culprit to justice. By October 2017, the police finally got a breakthrough. They recovered a DNA sample of an unidentified male from Nikki's clothing. They ran the DNA through their criminal record, but it took them eight months to find a match. On April 7, 2018, Northumbria police conducted a raid on a house located in the Stockton area of Teesside. They arrested a man suspected of Nikki's slaying. The police built their case for four years before bringing forward the charges against the suspect arrested in 2018. On May 24, 2022, the suspect, identified as 54-year-old David Thomas Boyd, appeared at Newcastle Crown Court. Then, on June 20, 2022, Boyd pled not guilty. Before proceeding with Boyd's trial, the police needed to rectify their slip-up from 28 years ago. In May 2023, Northumbria police apologized to George Heron for bringing forward the civil lawsuit of £7,000 in 1994. On April 20, 2023, Boyd's trial commenced at Newcastle Crown Court. The prosecution alleged that Boyd lured Nicky Allen to a wasteland near the river where witnesses mentioned seeing Nicky skipping to catch up with a man, but they never saw her abduction. According to the prosecution, Boyd lured Nikki through a boarded-up window of the old exchange building. There, he brutally hit her with a brick, causing severe head injuries, and then inflicted multiple stab wounds to her chest, heart, and lungs. The post-mortem examination revealed she had experienced blunt force trauma to her head, likely rendering her unconscious before the stabbing. A witness recalled hearing a loud scream around 10 p.m., pinpointing the timing of the attack. Nikki's body was discovered the following day in the building's basement by volunteers aiding in the search for her. During the trial, it was revealed that at the time of Nikki's demise, Boyd went by the name David Smith or David Bell, and was 25 years old. The case relied on circumstantial evidence, but was described as compelling, given Boyd's DNA found on Nikki's clothing. Boyd suggested to the police that Nikki might have transferred his DNA by wiping her hands on his saliva which he claimed had accidentally landed on her clothes after he spat from his balcony that night. Additionally, it was reported that Boyd was familiar with the old exchange building's layout and had previously used the same window a few days earlier when he took a boy there to search for pigeons. Yes, David Boyd is the same neighbor who told the detectives 30 years ago that he knew Nikki Allen. He saw Nikki that night. He even admitted back then he had gone to the exchange building a few days before with a boy 
but the police were fixated on finding the man in the white shirt, and they never followed up on him. It turns out that back in those days, David Boyd's girlfriend used to babysit Nikki Allen. More surprisingly, David Boyd's past included child violation convictions that surfaced during the trial. In March 2000, he was convicted of indecently assaulting a young girl at a park in Stockton, an incident that occurred on April 8, 1999. Additionally, in 1986, Boyd was convicted of breaching the peace for approaching four children in Sacreston County, Durham, and grabbing a 10-year-old girl. 30 years ago, police completely ignored the connection of a known abuser with Nikki Allen. During the trial, the defense argued that the various pieces of evidence presented did not completely prove Boyd's guilt in this case, and suggested that these were merely coincidences. Mrs. Justice Christina Lambert informed the jury that the case relied on circumstantial evidence, and emphasized the absence of direct evidence pointing to Boyd's guilt. As the trial progressed, it was reported that Boyd opted not to testify or provide evidence in his defense. On May 12, 2023, Boyd was declared guilty of Nikki's demise after a jury comprising 10 women and two men deliberated for two and a half hours before reaching a verdict. On May 23, 2023, Boyd received a life sentence with a minimum term of 29 years before he could be considered for parole. His eligibility for parole will commence on August 16, 2049. Boyd intends to appeal both his conviction and the sentence handed down to him. In August 2023, Sharon Henderson intended to file a lawsuit against Northumbria Police due to the extensive 30-year duration it took to find the culprit. Following this, in September 2023, news surfaced regarding a review of the police investigation that spanned 30 years. This review was scheduled to be conducted by either the Independent Office for Police Conduct or another police force. In the Nikki Allen case, the police had a difficult case with very little evidence. However, they failed Sharon and Nikki profoundly from the start and continuously over the years. Despite having an ideal suspect, they repeatedly missed identifying him. Ultimately, what shifted the course was the advancements in forensics and DNA technology. They finally pinpointed DNA on Nikki's body, unequivocally linking it to David Boyd. Niels Holger was born and raised in West Germany on December 30, 1976. When he was a small boy, he grew up in the coastal town of Wilhelmshaven in Lower Saxony. Niels said that throughout his childhood, he was never exposed to violence at home. His parents didn't fight any more than a normal set of parents would, and his home was very well put together. He also explained that he grew up in a highly protective atmosphere. These days, most of us would probably call this type of home environment sheltered, and that definitely seems to be the case for Niels. His parents did everything within their power to keep him free from harm and to keep him on the straight and narrow. To top them off, both his father and his grandmother had dedicated their lives to helping people. They were both nurses, and it seems like Niels always looked up to them. His father set a great example for what a nurse should be, after having followed in the footsteps of his own mother. When Niels became of age, he decided that he would become a nurse as well. On the surface, it seemed like Niels also wanted to do everything within his power to help others in his community. However, as time passed by, his desires would become much darker and more sinister. Niels went through very in-depth training to become a nurse. Unlike nursing schools that you may find in the United States and other parts of the world, in Germany at the time, nursing could be taken as a vocational course instead of requiring countless years of college. By 1997, Niels had completed his training and became a nurse, working at St. Wilhad Hospital. He was just 21 years of age. By 2004, Niels had begun to explore other opportunities in life. Niels managed to find love and decided to settle down a bit more. He and his longtime girlfriend were married in 2004, and later that year, his wife would give birth to their daughter. By 1999, Niels had decided to move on from his job at the hospital and began working for a different clinic, while holding down an identical position as a nurse. This was the result of accepting a job offer at Oldenburg Clinic. He would be tasked with taking care of patients in the intensive care unit at a cardiac surgery ward known as Ward 211. 
Niels had been working here for several years before staff members began to get a bit suspicious of him. By August of 2001, just two years after accepting his new job, a large meeting was called at the clinic. The board members were concerned that a shockingly large number of patients had been losing their lives over the last year. The leaders explained that there was an unusually large number of deaths that had seemingly come out of nowhere. To top this off, there was also an increase in the number of resuscitations and an increase in the number of deaths months after resuscitation. According to the board, 58% of these deaths took place while Niels was on duty. After the meeting had drawn to a close, Niels knew that the leaders of the clinic were on to him. The following day, he would call in sick for work and would remain away from the clinic for a total of three weeks. For Niels, this seemed like the perfect way to lay low. However, he only made his situation worse. This is because after leaving his job for a short time, the number of deaths dramatically decreased at the clinic. For some of the workers who were suspicious of him, this proved that Niels may have had a part in some of the unusual deaths that had been taking place recently. Once he returned back to work, Niels was asked by one of the head physicians in Ward 211 to transfer to a different unit. It's unknown if this was due to a difference in opinion or if the doctor truly felt that Niels' skills would be more useful elsewhere. Nevertheless, Niels accepted his proposal and would soon be transferred to the anesthesiology unit later that year in 2001. It was at this point that the heat really began to amp up for Niels. The head physician at his new ward explained that he didn't like how Niels always forced himself into emergency situations. To add to this, he explained to Niels that after he would become involved in emergency situations, the patients would have a significantly higher chance of passing away or facing serious difficulties. The doctor never accused Niels of anything outright, but it seems as though his words were very clear. Soon after the two had this conversation, Niels was approached by one of the leaders of the clinic. The worker gave Niels an ultimatum. Niels was told that he would need to transfer units once again or be fired from his position and given three months of severance pay. If he accepted the transfer, he would be placed in the logistics unit that did nothing but help move patients from one place to another throughout the hospital and clinic. That way, potential lives weren't in danger. It doesn't seem like Niels liked either of these options. Soon after the conversation with the clinic leader, he began looking for a job elsewhere. Just a couple of weeks after the meeting with the leader of the clinic, Niels was given a very good reference letter by one of his superiors. In the letter, the superior explained that Niels was an incredible nurse that always went above and beyond what was expected of him. The letter acknowledged his devotedness and cooperative conduct as well, and even explained that every task he completed was to the utmost satisfaction. It seems that even though the clinic threatened to fire him, they didn't hold any ill will against him or they really just wanted him to move on. It's difficult to know which way they were leaning. By December of that year, 2002, Niels had accepted a new job at the Delman Horse Clinic. Unfortunately, his questionable behavior did not end when he left his former job. At his new clinic, the dark cloud would continue to linger over Niels and his clinic. As soon as he joined the new team, deaths rose to unprecedented levels. Fatalities began to rise and were occurring every time Niels was on duty. For the most part, these patients would be losing their lives due to arrhythmia or other blood and heart-related problems. Many of his new co-workers began to shy away from him, not wanting to become involved in whatever was going on around him. It seems that many of his superiors were suspicious of him as well, but none of them took a step forward and accused him of anything, as police would later find out in court proceedings. By all means, this was gross negligence on the part of the clinic, as some of his co-workers had found four empty vials of agmaline while Niels was on duty one day, which causes life-threatening arrhythmia and heart-related problems. This information was taken to the leaders of the clinic, but they did nothing to stop him. A brief investigation into the matter proved that no doctors had prescribed that medication recently and none of the patients had been taking that medication when the vials were found. All eyes were now on Niels, though it seemed like everyone around him was too scared to do anything about it. By June of 2005, police were finally beginning to close in on Niels. One of his co-workers had managed to catch him intentionally sabotaging a patient's medical pump. As the worker soon learned, he had been injecting it with the gymaline, the same chemical he was suspected of three years prior. This incident was enough to finally get the police involved. So, they showed up and began conducting an investigation. 
They found that Niels had been tampering with other patients throughout the years, and soon enough, the case began to explode. Police requested all of the death records and time cards for the previous two years, taking their investigation all the way back to 2003. It didn't take them long at all to begin connecting the dots, and every trail they followed led back to Niels. The investigation would soon come to the conclusion that, over the last two years, at least 73% of the deaths at this clinic could be connected to Niels in some way or another. Though, it seems like the law works much differently in Germany than it does in other parts of the world. Even though this was definitely proven by investigators, there was still only a small penalty to be paid by Niels. Rather than being sentenced to prison for life, as he would have been if he lived in the United States, he was only facing five years behind bars and a temporary suspension of his nursing license. After being taken to trial with these allegations, he was found guilty in December of 2006. He was then taken away to prison to face his punishment. However, he wouldn't get off that easily. No sooner than his sentence was handed down, a team appealed his conviction. Soon enough, his conviction was reversed, but not the way you might be expecting. It wasn't reversed so as to release Niels from prison. Rather, it was reversed in exchange for a larger sentence. In the end, he was handed a seven and a half year sentence, and his nursing license was to be permanently revoked. By January of 2014, it was almost time for Niels to be released from prison. Police knew that he must have been involved in more crimes than he had been previously sentenced for. So, they began working on getting to the bottom of every last death that occurred on Niels' watch. The local district attorney's office helped with the investigation, and by September of 2014, Niels Hogel was suspected of at least three counts of murder, as well as two counts of attempted murder. It seems that at this point, Niels knew that the game was up and that he had been found out. He decided not to resist the charges and instead confessed. Though, he shocked the police with his confession. Not only did Niels accept involvement for taking the lives of three people and trying to take the lives of two others, but he added that he had claimed the lives of at least 30 others during this time. After investigating the issues even further, officers learned of 90 patients that had been poisoned by Niels. Of these 90 patients, about 60 were successfully resuscitated. However, the remaining 30 lost their lives. Just a few months after learning this, Niels Hogel was sentenced to life in prison. His sentence was finalized in March of 2015. The problem is that despite all of this, prosecutors still don't know the motive behind Niels crimes. They suspect that he simply acted out of boredom and a sick desire to kill. However, others believe that he may have been trying to showcase how good he was at resuscitating someone. Though, this is nothing but speculation. Investigators still suspect that there was far more to this case than meets the eye. So they continued their investigations even further and kept digging into Neil's past, as well as the many deaths that took place at his various places of work. By October of 2014, they had learned that another 200 people had likely been victimized. Though these weren't cases like they had investigated previously. Before of the 90 people Niels had victimized, only 30 passed away. However, of the 200 cases they were now investigating, all 200 of them passed away, meaning there were likely hundreds of others who had been poisoned by Niels, but simply didn't know about it. The case had grown to such a massive degree that the local police needed to create a special task force to investigate Niels crimes, with the task force being dubbed Cardio, spelt with AK. The prosecutors knew that they needed concrete evidence to help push these cases forward. To do this, they decided to exhume 134 of the victims that were linked to the cases. This task led them to visit 67 different cemeteries. But in most of these cases, the victims had decomposed far too much to be able to prove their allegations. In addition to these cases, a further 101 victims were suspected, but their bodies had been cremated, so there was no way to verify these accusations. Even more suspected victims were exhumed in 2015, and it was found that they had trace amounts of unprescribed heart medication in their blood. 37 other cases were opened in 2016, but it was around this time that police realized that their efforts were futile. No matter how many victims they managed to uncover, nothing was going to alter Neil's sentence. Thus, they began to take a step back on their investigative efforts and revealed to the public in 2017 that he was officially connected to around 90 cases, but that they suspected him of hundreds more. 
It was here that his case eventually died down while officers submitted their information to the courts, awaiting a trial that was scheduled to take place in 2018 and 2019. In the end, 100 charges were placed against Niels at trial. Niels Hogel admitted to 43 of the cases on the first day of the trial. He claimed that he couldn't remember 52 of the victims, then denied any involvement in five of the remaining victims. As the trial finally came to a close, Niels Hogel was found guilty of 85 murders. Needless to say, he will be spending the rest of his life behind bars, but the impact of his actions still resonates through the community, and it seems like police may still be investigating some additional cases that could be placed against him in the coming years. In December of 1987, Barbara Blatnick was a typical 17-year-old girl from Garfield Heights, Ohio. She lived on Band Drive with her mother, Teresa, her father, John, and her 19-year-old sister, Donna. Better known as Barbie, she had puffy, feathered, 1980s-style blonde hair and was known to be a people person. Bright and cheery, always happy and bubbling. Barbie was beloved by all. Her father called her a free spirit who lived for heavy metal music, makeup, dancing, and babysitting. She always socialized with her extensive circle of friends. Barbie's sister, Donna, knew her younger sister as a girl who lived life to the fullest, partying and enjoying her life. Barbie enjoyed drinking, experimenting with illegal substances, smoking, and embracing the party lifestyle. She had a likeness for loud heavy metal music, with ACDC being her favorite band. Barbie switched high schools in January. She transitioned from Garfield Heights High School to Erie View Catholic. She attended as a junior. According to Donna, her sister had an affinity for boys and was known to date various individuals without committing exclusively to anyone. She liked to be free. She was too young to be tied down. This free-natured spirit got her in trouble on a few occasions. There was one person she liked to see more often than others. Barbie had a boyfriend named Jerry. Their relationship was characterized by its on and off nature over the course of about a year. It was casual dating as teenagers do, nothing too serious or tied down. Furthermore, Barbie maintained a close-knit group of girlfriends. Despite being a handful at times, Barbie had no known enemies. In fact, she had a lot of friends. Everyone knew the blonde with the happiest smile. On December 19, 1987, a normal Saturday afternoon, Barbie went off with friends to attend a party. Dressed in jeans and a sweater and accessorized with jewelry, she carried her comb, money, and cigarettes in her back pocket. This was customary for her, as she hardly ever kept a purse or a bag. She did not like handling things at a party. Parties were for fun. Newspaper reports from that time differ on the exact time of her leaving her home. Some cited 4 p.m and others stated 6.30 p.m. It is unclear why there is a time difference, or whether it is relevant. Her elder sister Donna recalls saying, Bye, have fun! As Barbie went off, a party could mean anything. It could range from a small group of eight people in a living room to a larger event with 100 attendees, or even a few teenagers hanging out in a backyard or a park. Barbie was picked up from her home by her friends, Michelle Trotten and Sheila Salmon. Then, the girls visited a local bar, here they could be served underage. It was common for Barbie and her friends to patronize such places where they were flexible about drinking rules and age limits. They never ID'd anyone. This might sound incredibly shady now, bars allowing minors in, but in the 80s and 90s, a lot of bars and pubs did not implement age restrictions to get more customers to walk in through the doors. Regulations and laws became a bit stricter in the early 2000s, but before that, a 16-year-old could easily order a drink at a bar. Then they made their way back to Garfield Heights to visit their friend Philip Null. This was between 7 and 8 p.m. There they drank and hung out some more. Then they went to a local bike shop on Warner Road named Motorcycle Specialties. It was within walking distance. They often hung out with a group of neighborhood boys there. The owner of the bike shop welcomed pretty girls and would provide alcohol and marijuana for their entertainment. He believed if there were girls, he was bound to get customers to hang around for longer or return. The teens often hung out in the basement of the bike shop. The shop owner, Jeff, had set it up for such parties. The party included Barbie, Michelle, Sheila, and Linda, among others. Barbie's ex-boyfriend, Dave, was also present at this party. 
At 10.30 p.m., Barbie made a call to her parents. The exact location from where she made the call remains unknown. She informed her family that she would be returning soon. This act was highly unusual for Barbie, as she typically did not check in. She was a bit of a rebel. She liked to be treated as a grown-up and hated curfews or restrictions. Normally, Barbie would spend time with friends and return home later, or she would spend the night at a friend's place. Sleepovers for Barbie were normal. Her family had accepted that sometimes she even liked to stay out all night. But she was a sensible girl. She took calculated risks. Her family also knew tying her down could backfire, as she did not want to be restricted. Given that this was 1987, there were no cell phones. So to make a call home, Barbie would have to use a landline. Her parents picked up her call. According to her friend, Michelle, while they were at the shop, nothing appeared out of the ordinary. There were no individuals who seemed suspicious or threatening. Michelle stated that they remained at the shop until 3.15 a.m. After leaving, Michelle drove Barbie to the intersection of Warner Road and Grand Division Avenue, near the bike shop. This area is like a mix of residential and commercial buildings, including convenience stores and car repair shops. Barbie told Michelle that she was heading to Jerry's house. He lived with his older brother Bob and their parents behind the Actelco Auto Parts store. After Michelle dropped Barbie off, they went their separate ways. What she did not know was that Jerry was not home. He was hanging out with his friends that night. It is unclear whether Barbie knocked on the door or just left when nobody answered. Some possibilities include Bob, Jerry's brother, or someone else answering the door. It is unclear if Barbie did try to contact Jerry. While walking the streets, Barbie's home would have been far, but she could take a shortcut through the woods and reach home sooner. Another option was for Barbie to walk to Gina's home. Her friend Gina lived with her boyfriend Rodney just two blocks away on Grand Division Avenue. Rodney was not keen on her going out with Barbie to Warner Road that night. Gina revealed that Barbie called her that Saturday. She invited her to hang out, but she declined. She later regretted this decision. She believed she could have protected Barbie. Gina mentioned that her boyfriend was one of three feared brothers in the area. She implied that Barbie might have been safer with them. Despite this, Barbie did not make it to Gina's house that night, although it was close to where she was dropped off. Despite the unusual call saying that she would be home soon, Barbie did not arrive home that night. Her parents went to bed without much of a thought. They assumed she was staying with a friend. They were not alarmed when her bed remained unslept. The family was already caught up in the upcoming Christmas festivities as well as Donna's wedding. Barbie was supposed to be the maid of honor. It was all very exciting. The following morning, Barbie's mother and sister went out for Christmas shopping. Donna bought Barbie a new blow dryer for her fluffy hair. They also bought things they might need for the wedding and lots of presents. But as soon as Barbie's mother pulled into the driveway, she felt something was wrong and said so to Donna. Two police officers had arrived at their house just after they left for the shops. They summoned Barbie's father to the morgue in Cuyahoga Falls. He was confused as to why the officers were asking him to come with them. He had to ID someone. As he went on his way, they informed him of the impossible. His little girl had been found deceased. Barbie is gone. These were her mother's words when she had pulled into the driveway. It was pure intuition. Her family was distraught. This was shocking and highly unexpected. Barbie's body was found nude and bruised in the woods off O'Neill Road. This is near the Blossom Music Center in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. But that is not the worst part of the tragedy. The body was not where everyone initially thought she was found. The detectives came back on December 22nd and set the record straight. Turns out, Barbie was discovered near a wooded area next to a quiet access road in Summit County. This place was not busy or crowded on a Sunday morning in December. As for Blossom Music Center, it is highly doubted it was even open in December, except maybe for some special holiday. Where was Barbie found? Definitely not the town's usual teen hangout spot. Details surrounding Barbie's discovery are a bit here and there. There have been newspaper reports suggesting that an employee of KST Oil and Gas stumbled upon her body while driving along the road. Reports indicated she was found approximately 10 feet north of O'Neill Road. This is exactly within an area where the road shifted from running north-south to a sharp east-west curve before resuming its north-south route. 
This particular section of O'Neill Road lay between two sparsely used roads. It ran parallel to another road bordering the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation Area. It does not sound like a place for an oil and gas worker to be going along. But maybe he visited the isolated road as part of duty or nearby work obligations. According to Barbie's sister Donna, the person who found her said Barbie lay naked and discarded like used trash on the roadside. She might have been barely breathing even, still alive despite her horrible ordeal and clinging to life. Tragically, her struggle for survival was short-lived. This left whoever found her haunted by meeting someone on the brink of losing their life on such an isolated road. The Summit County Coroner, William A. Cox, wasted no time in conducting Barbie's autopsy promptly after her discovery. A preliminary report surfaced the Monday, containing Cox's intriguing statement. His controversial statement gained attention from various media outlets, including the Beacon Journal. Cox's conclusion was surprising. Barbie had not sustained her injuries where she was found. She likely met the person who took her life elsewhere and was on the brink of her demise. Then her body was transported to the location where it was laid merely hours before its discovery. Cox gave some explanations for his findings. Given that Barbie was still breathing when found, she would not have survived the long exposure to the cold following a brutal assault. She should have lost her life within an hour or so after the assault. Alternatively, someone, perhaps the oil and gas worker or another eyewitness, could have traveled to O'Neill Road mere hours before she was discovered. This means her body was not placed at that particular spot. Coroner Cox remained steadfast in his timeline assessment. He insisted that the O'Neill Road site was not the scene of the crime. However, the basis for this claim, whether derived from blood evidence, signs of a struggle, or other indicators of foul play, remains undisclosed. The method by which Barbie was transported to the dump site, whether carried, dragged, or thrown out from a car, remains a mystery. Additionally, Cox noted Barbie was quite possibly drunk when she lost her life. This report proved Michelle's account of events to be true. While Coroner Cox did not exactly specify the time of demise, it has been established that Barbie was still alive when discovered at 10.20 a.m. By deducing from Michelle's provided timeline, Barbie was last seen at 3.30 a.m. This means that the assault occurred sometime between those hours. The attack was so completely brutal that it left deep, dark bruise marks on Barbie's neck. Her neck had to be covered with a scarf during the funeral due to the severity of the bruises. She was found with contact lenses in her eyes and a ring given to her at school. It was inscribed with her school's name and first name. Her clothes, jewelry, comb, and money were missing. This was particularly curious because the assailant took the time to take off her other jewelry, but he did not take off the ring. This hinted that perhaps he left the ring so she would be easily identified. Maybe slaying her was not the plan. Or maybe Barbie had taken off her clothes and jewelry because she knew her assailant and was intimate with him. The detectives could only guess. After the autopsy, Coroner Cox made some statements to the media that were interesting. Barbie passed away due to strangulation. There was no way of telling whether it was by hand or with some object because of the dark marks. But the most important element was, she had been assaulted. The coroner also claimed she was assaulted by more than one person. This tragedy was shared with the media on December 22nd. Given the fact that this was 1987, forensic DNA analysis was not that developed. This was hard to understand. How could the coroner make such a claim? The coroner lifted different samples of male DNA from different parts of Barbie's body. Blood testing revealed different blood groups. There was no reason for Barbie to hang out in the area where she was found. Barbie and her friends frequented Blossom Music Center. Her investigation was limited to where the body was found, not where she was last seen alive or the party she had attended with her friends. If the person who took her life was anywhere near Garfield Heights, then it is highly possible they wanted to dump her body as soon as they were done. So, Summit County was a viable option. An interesting find on her body was two lines written in the palm of her left hand. The first line contained a series of numbers, and the second line consisted of words. This was quite possibly an address. This is where the story gets truly shocking. Without Barbie's family's consent or informing them, her left hand was amputated and sent to a lab in Washington to be studied by the FBI. It was, of course, because they had superior technology, 
but it was unethical that her family did not know about this happening. DNA found under the teenager's fingernails suggested she had fought back against her attacker. She was a tough broad, one of her friends mentioned in an interview, describing her fighting spirit. Barbie was not one to give up so easily. Unfortunately, that is the last anyone heard of the writing. Perhaps it was the number of a taxi or the address of the party. Maybe Barbie was meeting someone. Whatever the case, the information was lost and handled poorly. Time passed by. Ten years passed, and in 1997, the lead Cuyahoga Falls detective on the case, Larry Wagner, claimed it was a hard-to-solve case. The case was committed 30 miles off of Garfield Heights, and it was hard to gain any witnesses. While Barbie was a popular teen, nobody knew anything since Michelle dropped her off. The newspapers added further confusion to her story. Cleveland was a relatively safe area. They statistically had a high solve rate of such cases. But there were rumors at the time that Barbara's case was part of a serial perpetrator's spree. By the end of 1987, there were four unsolved cases of four women in the area. They all occurred in the last four months of that year. The women all had something in common. They were all middle-class white women in safe neighborhoods. The bodies appeared to have been dumped in a diamond pattern. There were three main theories, each stirring up panic and fear. The first theory suggested that someone close to the victim may have attacked and slain her. The second theory proposed that perhaps it was someone she thought she knew or someone on the outskirts of her social circles. Lastly, the most chilling theory suggested that she may have been a victim of an unknown serial perpetrator. Just a few years back, there was an incident involving a local man named George. While drunk at a bar, he confessed to a disturbing story. While talking to Kelly, a friend of Barbie's, he revealed something that should have been investigated years ago. George claimed that on the night of Barbie's demise, Jerry Barbara's boyfriend and his two brothers approached him for assistance. They asked for his help in cleaning their car with bleach and washing their clothes. When George questioned the reason behind this urgent cleaning spree, one of them revealed, we just slain Barbie Blatnik. Shocked by this revelation, Kelly later relayed the story to Barbie's best friend Gina, who then took it upon herself to share it with the detective. However, Gina felt that the detective did not show much interest in this information. If George's account holds any truth, and he is not merely a drunken storyteller, he could be telling the truth and perhaps detectives should have looked into it. But one reason not to pursue this lead was that Jerry had been thoroughly investigated. As time went on, one of the brothers that were mentioned in George's statement passed away. And just like that, time buried the files of Barbara Blatnik. Three decades passed and each year her family held a small memorial in her honor. But with time, everyone moved on. Donna became Donna Zanath, and she went on to have her own children and grandchildren. Barbie's mother passed away, unable to make sense of who ended her daughter's life so mercilessly. As technology advanced, Donna started Facebook pages in her name, looking for answers tirelessly, but it all faded away like a bad memory. There was no hope of finding any answers. Donna suffered from severe PTSD. She forgot her childhood memories and could not remember much about high school. She got a tattoo on her arm that read, It is French for I miss you, but translates to You are missing from me. She frequented the West Side, reliving the memories of her sister. With time, in August of 2019, the case came to be highlighted by the Porch Light Project. The Porch Light Project was a non-profit organization that worked on solving cold cases in Northern Ohio. The organization partnered with the Cuyahoga Falls Police Department. It was founded by famous Akron author and investigative reporter James Renner. The Porch Light Project managed to rake up $6,000 to carry out a DNA analysis. All this time, Barbie's file was buried away. But with advances in genetic genealogy, there was a chance that maybe her assailant would be finally captured. The DNA recovered under Barbie's nails was sent for analysis. Finally, in May 2020, 32 years after Barbie's untimely demise, CFPD had some shocking new information. Barbara Blatnick's assailant was identified. Police arrested 67-year-old James E. Zastonic. He was charged with first-degree slaying. Zastonic is a resident of Cleveland, Ohio. He did not have a criminal record, but his family was bad news. Allegedly, Zastonic's brothers had also served time in prison for assault crimes. Surprisingly, on the 30th anniversary of Barbie's tragedy, 
one of Zastonic's siblings went missing and went on to become a cold case. Ben Zastonic went missing from his home without a trace. Karma or a coincidence? Was there a connection? Once he learned that DNA connected him to this case, he admitted on a phone call that he might have been intimate with Barbie. According to him, he was driving down Warner Road when he saw the teen. He asked her if she needed a ride and she said yes. She wanted to make a call, so he took her to his house. He lived nearby. Barbie argued with someone on the phone and was upset when she hung up. She started crying and then he started to comfort her. Then he said, one thing led to another and they ended up in bed. The last he saw Barbie was when he dropped her off at the corner of Grand Division Warner Road. This was his final story as he denied involvement in her untimely demise. Zastonic's trial date was set for the 22nd of October 2021. The bond was set to be $35,000, which was paid immediately. Donna was not happy about the man behind her sister's fate roaming around free. She was quite vocal about it. But unfortunately, Zastonic was already very ill. Suffering from cancer, he went on to live with a relative in Mogadar while receiving hospice services. Donna's Facebook friend told her in a private message that Zastonic was truly sick. The man maintained his innocence, and the first time Donna saw him was via video conference. Zastonic was in his brother's house drinking coffee. This angered Donna because her sister was gone, and the man allegedly responsible for it was roaming free. COVID-19 cases spiked during this time, and it was rumored that either the trial would shift, or everyone in court would have to wear masks. Zastonic was already too sick to be in court. Barbie's family believed they would finally get answers on their questions. Why was Barbie left at the side of the road broken, beaten, and naked? What happened to her clothes, shoes, and other belongings? COVID-19 had already caused a lot of delays as it is and the case was late in going to trial. With two months left to go to trial, in August of 2021, Barbie's family once more lost all hope of having any answers. James Zastonic passed away, taking the event of December 19, 1987 to the grave with him. Donna had to find closure all over again. She thanked the Porchlight Project for at least putting a name to the tragedy of Barbie Blatnik. Her loved ones sought comfort in the fact that this person who violated the teen and took her life so barbarically would no longer hurt anyone. On October 31, 1992, a young woman named Candace Finaghi was working at a gas station just like any other day. But this day turned out to be different. Her boyfriend Danny showed up and they got into a huge argument because Danny had done something that really upset Candace. To her horror, he'd asked another girl out to dinner, and that was the last straw for Candace. She had enough of his lies. In her anger, she kicked Danny's truck and left a dent in it. Danny left, leaving Candace seething with frustration. She was so mad that she left her work and decided to visit a friend at the Kipling Memorial Union Hospital to cool down. But things didn't go as planned. Candace arrived at the Kipling Memorial Union Hospital, hoping to find her friend there. But she wasn't around. Candace was still really upset and finding it hard to calm down. She realized she needed some help to settle her emotions. So, when a nurse suggested she should talk to a doctor, Candace accepted the suggestion. Dr. John Schneeberger was on duty that night. Born on January 1, 1961 in Zambia, John Schneeberger came from a family that loved learning. He attended the respected Kearsney College in South Africa, where he stood out in school and made many friends. It was no shocker when he followed in his brother's footsteps and entered medical school. Leaving behind his days at Kearsney, he continued his education at the University of Stellenbosch near Cape Town. He graduated in December of 1984, proving himself to be an exceptional student, especially in a niche theology. Around 1987, John Schneeberger moved to Canada and settled in Kipling, located in the south of Saskatchewan. After fulfilling all the requirements to be a doctor in Canada, he officially joined the medical team at Kipling Medical Center in December 1988. Soon enough, everyone was talking about the dashing young doctor with a unique accent who just arrived in town. He was one of just two doctors in the whole area. It didn't take long for him to become known as Dr. John. His first name became his badge. 
The townsfolk really took to him, and he carved a reputation as a caring and kind doctor in this small tight-knit community. His smooth way and polished manners made him a hit with everyone, especially with the ladies. He shared that his female patients were so smitten that they'd sometimes pretend to be sick just to see him. He was tall, good-looking, and very charismatic. He was the town's most eligible bachelor. At his doctor's office, he met Lisa Dillman, a single mom with two kids. In 1991, they tied the knot. He embraced Lisa's children like his own, even cheering them on at sports events. The couple were blessed with two more daughters, born just a year apart. Dr. John wasn't only good at regular doctoring. He realized that the town needed more specialized medical care. So, despite being a full-time doctor and a dad of four, he trained even more and became an expert in obstetrics and gynecology by 1992 at age 38. In addition to all of this, he was also leading a group to gather money for a new swimming pool that the whole town could enjoy. He also took charge of a special class about relationships and related material at the high school. Life was looking great for Dr. John, but things were about to take a turn. Candace knew Dr. John well because he'd helped her deliver her baby just nine months earlier. She opened up to him about her fight with Danny and how she was worried about her strong reaction. Dr. John had actually seen Candace and Danny arguing before at a fundraiser for the local swimming pool. He knew Candace had a fiery side, and this time she just couldn't calm herself down. Dr. John stepped out of the room for a quick moment and returned holding a tiny syringe. Candace was a bit surprised because she thought she'd get some pills to take. But the doctor explained that a shot would work better considering her situation. Candace trusted him, so she offered her right arm for the shot. As soon as the medicine went in, her body started feeling really heavy, like it was asleep. She could hardly move. With Dr. John's help, she moved from the chair to the exam bed, lying on her left side facing the wall. It was a strange feeling for Candace. The medicine that Dr. John used was called Versity, and it's a kind of sedative. It's normally used when patients have to go through painful procedures like a colonoscopy. Normally it makes people go to sleep and forget what happened during the procedure. But you know, everyone's different, and Candace was merely paralyzed, not asleep or unconscious. In the fog of confusion, she felt someone undo her jeans and move her underwear to the side. But she couldn't react. Then the trusted doctor did the unthinkable to her. Candace wanted to yell, but all that came out was a weak, raspy sound. During this awful moment, she never saw anyone's face, but Dr. John was the only one in the room with her. After everything was over, the doctor fixed her underwear and pants. He zipped up his own pants and left the room. Candace was all mixed up, but that strong medicine made her too out of it to do anything. A nurse checked on her and saw that Candace was too tired and dizzy to drive home, so she suggested that Candace spend the night. Candace didn't tell the nurse about what had happened, and feeling super confused, she went to sleep. Dr. John likely assumed that she wouldn't remember anything because of the drug, but that wasn't the case. When Candace awoke the next morning, her head felt fuzzy and she wasn't quite sure about what had happened for a moment. Dr. John was usually so kind, how could he do something so terrible? But her doubt didn't last long. She quickly remembered everything that had happened and all its details. She had to wait until the doctor finished his morning rounds before she could leave the hospital. When she finally saw him, she asked him about the medicine he'd given her. He was calm, then he just smiled and asked her why she wanted to know and whether it gave her wild dreams. In that moment, Candace understood he'd never confessed to what he did to her but she didn't realize how hard it would be to prove it. Even though she was traumatized and still feeling the effects of the strong medicine, Candace managed to stay focused. What she did next was crucial if she ever wanted to show that the doctor was guilty. She took off her underwear and saw a stain. Quickly, she put her underwear in a plastic bag and sealed it up, knowing that this might be the only proof she had. Candace understood that she needed to tell someone about what had happened as soon as possible. But she didn't feel safe reporting it in her hometown of Kipling because she knew the doctor had friends in the local police force. Instead, she decided to drive for two hours to the city of Regina. There, she went to a clinic where they could do the proper tests. 
The tests showed that the substance on Candace's underwear was definitely boundly fluid. They also found some on her jeans and in swabs taken from her private area. The hospital immediately notified the police and Regina and Candace told them what happened. She explained that she hadn't had any kind of intercourse in the weeks before the incident. So the boundly fluid they found could only belong to the person who attacked her, Dr. John Schneeberger. Back in the early 1990s, DNA was a new thing in the world of science. The first time evidence was used to catch a criminal in Canada was in 1989, just three years prior to what happened to Candace. So it was incredibly smart of her to go to the clinic right away to get the tests done. They could use the DNA in the Bonley fluid to check if it was the same as the doctor's DNA. The Kipling police were eventually made aware of the situation and went to the hospital to look into it themselves. They began to try to figure out when the assault might have taken place. They found out that there was a 20-minute period where Dr. John could have committed the assault. In the hospital that night, there was only one other man, whose wife was having a baby, and he never left her alone. The police then went to Dr. John's house to question him about the incident. He was extremely upset and said that Candace was acting really crazy when she came to the hospital on Halloween night. He told them he gave her medicine to calm her down. He said Candace might have gotten things mixed up and maybe even dreamt about the assault while she was under the influence of the medicine. He suggested that she may have made these claims in order to extort him. But to prove he was innocent, he gave a sample of his blood for DNA testing. The DNA testing took a while and for Candace, it felt like an eternity. During this time, news about Candace's claims had spread around the small town of Kipling. Not many people believed her. Because Candace didn't talk to the nurses who were working on the night of the assault, some people started to doubt if the assault really happened. Some thought that maybe Candace and the doctor had consenting intercourse and that Candace kept the evidence as a way to make the doctor pay her to drop the accusations. Some people even blamed her for what happened. Candace felt really alone during this period. On the other hand, Dr. John received a lot of support. People saw him as a good family man and there had never been any accusations against him before. When he told his wife, Lisa, about what Candace said, she did not have any doubts about his innocence. Lisa couldn't believe their loving husband and the father of her kids would hurt anyone. She believed that Candace might have had a crush on her husband and was saying these things to hurt him because he didn't feel the same way about her. She didn't like Candace and felt angry that she was trying to damage her husband's reputation and their family's name. By now, the DNA test results had come in and to Candace's shock, the DNA in the bodily fluid found on her underwear didn't match Dr. John Schneeberger's blood sample. He was declared innocent. He openly shared his relief with his friends and colleagues, eager to move on. So was it a dream after all? And if it was, how could one explain the stains on her undergarments? However, the town did not require any reasoning. People were convinced that Candace had wrongly accused the respected doctor, and she lost several friends. Even her parents faced difficulties as they stood by Candace's side, always believing her. But Candace was not ready to back down. She was certain that Dr. John had assaulted her on Halloween, regardless of the DNA result. She pushed for a second test, absolutely convinced that Dr. John, being a medical expert, somehow manipulated his blood sample to change the results. Police had to concede that they didn't witness the initial blood test, which was required by law. Recognizing Candace's persistence, they approached Dr. John for a second blood sample. He was furious and offended by the request, but he reluctantly agreed. He understood that these accusations could tarnish his reputation and career. Throughout the ordeal, his wife, Lisa, stood firmly by his side, supporting him unwaveringly. In August of 1993, Dr. John went to a lab to provide a second blood sample. This time, two law enforcement officers were present to oversee the process. The doctor rolled up his left sleeve and the lab technician began to draw blood with a needle. However, Dr. John intervened, taking the needle from the technician and finishing the job himself. An RCMP officer stood nearby, observing closely. Dr. John filled one vial of blood and then he decided to fill a second vial just to be thorough. When the officer inquired about the bruises on his upper arm, Dr. John explained that the previous blood draw had injured a tendon, causing the bruising. 
The explanation seemed reasonable and the officer was satisfied. The officers then took the blood vials for testing. Six more months went by during which Candace became accustomed to the spiteful looks from the people in Kipling. Despite the challenges, she held on to her conviction that she was right and that the test results would eventually prove it. However, reality didn't align with her hopes. The outcome of the second test was revealed and, once again, Dr. John's blood sample did not match the DNA profile of the fluid discovered in Candace's underwear. The case against Dr. John Schneeberger came to a close in 1994. Once again, the DNA evidence seemed to contradict what Candace knew in her heart to be true. Lisa Schneeberger was particularly vocal, suggesting that Candace was seeking financial gain from the situation. It became a matter of a single young mother's word against an esteemed physician who was also a father of four, a figure highly esteemed in the community. The judgment Candace faced in Kipling was overwhelming. Feeling like an outsider in the place she'd grown up, she knew it was time to leave. With her daughter, she bid farewell to the town and relocated to Regina. In Kipling, life continued on its usual rhythm. The Schneeberger family moved forward, leaving the story in the past. Just a week after the second DNA test results were revealed, Dr. John Schneeberger became a Canadian citizen while still holding residency rights in South Africa. However, Candace didn't want to let go. Haunted by the thought, the Dr. John had escaped justice. Candace also feared he might harm someone else. Feeling determined to uncover the truth, she took matters into her own hands. With the assistance of her lawyer, she enlisted the help of a private investigator. Larry O'Brien, a retired member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police with 25 years of experience, had transitioned into working as a private investigator. After their initial conversation, he was convinced of Candace's honesty. He shared her suspicion that something wasn't right with Dr. John's DNA tests. They needed to find another way to demonstrate his guilt, a different approach to obtaining his DNA. O'Brien's initial attempt was quite clever. He had an assistant pose as a representative from a local radio station and visit Dr. John Schneeberger's place. The assistant tricked the doctor into participating in a fake contest and putting his entry into an envelope. After John sealed the envelope, he handed it back. It could have provided the DNA that would prove Candace's story. However, this plan didn't succeed. O'Brien later explained, something went wrong with the envelope. It got contaminated somehow even though we randomly picked it from a new box. That shouldn't have happened. In a close-knit town like Kipling, secrets were rare. People knew each other's business. The Schneeberger's cleaning lady was familiar with Candace's family and informed Lisa that the Fanakis had hired a private investigator. Lisa believed that the unpleasant situation was over and was furious to learn that Candace hadn't given up. Within a week, Candace's family received a letter stating that they were no longer welcome at the Kipling Medical Center. This was a significant issue in a town with only two doctors. If they fell ill, they'd have to seek medical assistance outside of Kipling. On Saturday, March 23, 1996, Larry O'Brien followed Dr. John in his car, waiting for him to park. The doctor's car had personalized plates with the first part of his last name, Schnee. There was no mistaking that this was the car of the man Candace believed had assaulted her. As soon as Dr. John was out of sight, the private investigator tried the driver's door, which, like most cars in Kipling, was unlocked. He knew exactly what he was searching for. He discovered strands of hair on the driver's seat headrest. He also checked the ashtray and found a used chapstick. It looked new, but when he opened it, he noticed the edge was worn. It had been used before. He rubbed it on the window area of an envelope and sealed it in a forensic bag. Candace borrowed money from her parents and paid an independent lab to conduct DNA tests. The hair samples didn't have roots, making them untestable. However, there was leftover saliva on the chapstick. After two weeks, the results arrived. It did not match Dr. John's blood sample. But there was yet another twist in the story. The DNA on Dr. John's chapstick was a match to the stain found in Candace's assault kit. What Candace had always believed was finally confirmed. Dr. John Schneeberger was indeed the one who had assaulted her. It took her four years to establish this, but the battle was far from finished. Despite the evidence from the chapstick, 
a major hurdle stood in their way because they definitely couldn't prove that John was the sole user of the chapstick, and only because the private investigator had gathered evidence by entering his car without permission, that evidence would be deemed unacceptable in court. They shared the evidence with the police, but their hands were somewhat tied. However, the evidence managed to convince the police that Candace was speaking the truth. They were certain of Dr. John's guilt. They just needed to find a different route to demonstrate it. The officers approached John with the evidence unearthed by Candace's private investigator and asked for a third blood sample. On November 20, 1996, Dr. John underwent another blood draw. This time, the police documented the entire process. When the nurse aimed to prick his finger, the doctor declined, explaining that he had a condition that would result in severe bruising if blood were taken from his hands. He extended his arm and cooperated. Without a court order, they couldn't force him to do something against his will. In the video recording of the testing procedure, you can hear the nurse expressing her surprise. The blood she just drawn from the doctor's left arm didn't appear fresh. It had a dark brown color, as if it were old. When the sample was examined, the technicians concluded that its quality was poor, making it impossible to conduct proper testing. Candace was furious. Why did they accept the blood if it seemed off? Why didn't they insist on another sample while the doctor was still at the lab? She'd come so far in proving that Dr. John wasn't the person he portrayed himself to be. She wasn't about to give up now. In a last-ditch effort, Candace took a bold step and filed a civil lawsuit against the doctor. She also reported his actions to the local medical society. During the court proceedings, it was clear that most people were on Dr. John's side. His wife, Lisa, was angry that Candace had accused her husband of such a terrible deed and refused to believe it could be true. She even used hurtful language to describe Candace in an interview with the local TV station. Unfortunately, nothing came of the civil lawsuit, and Candace had to face the reality that Dr. John might escape the consequences of his actions. But the tides were about to change. On the 25th of April, 1997, Lisa Schneeberger discovered something that was happening inside her own family home. Her 15-year-old daughter from her first marriage told her that something strange had been going on. Her stepdad visited her room in the night and gave her an injection. When she woke up, there was a condom wrapper in her bed. She took her mom to her bedroom to show her. Lisa was horrified and asked her daughter if it had happened before. The daughter said it wasn't the first time. Lisa remembered that one time she'd asked her husband about giving her daughter an injection, and he admitted to it, saying that the girl had been coughing, so he just wanted to give her something to help. Lisa never heard any coughing, but didn't give it a second thought. He was the doctor after all. Lisa realized that John's abuse of her daughter had started two years before, when she was only 13 years old. When Lisa asked her daughter why she hadn't said anything before, she explained her thought process. If her mom didn't believe Candace, why would she believe her? Never in her wildest dreams would she ever have imagined that the love of her life, the devoted father and stepfather, was, in fact, a predator. Lisa went into her husband's home office where she found syringes, coins, and sedatives, including Verst, hidden on the high shelf. When Lisa told the police everything and kicked John out of their home, it was a big step. Candace felt shocked when she heard the news. All those years of fighting for justice worried that John might hurt someone else, and now to know that he preyed on his own stepdaughter. It was not good news at all. Candace said she'd never forget the day she found out. The police took samples from John once more, this time hair, saliva, and blood. They took the blood from his finger. When the test results came back, they confirmed that Dr. John's DNA matched the DNA found on Candace's underwear. It also matched the DNA from the chapstick found in his car. John was arrested and faced charges for the assaults on both Candace Fanage and his stepdaughter. Dr. John tried to convince Lisa that he was innocent and asked her to stand by him. But Lisa, thankfully, chose to believe her daughter and turned away from Dr. John's efforts to change her mind. Lisa found herself alone with four kids, the youngest being just 13 months old. She had to sell the family car to cover the mortgage. She finally found a job at the Diabetes Association in Red Deer, Alberta. This allowed her to make a fresh start in a new place and support her family. 
In 1999, the trial of Dr. John Schneeberger began. Throughout the trial, he still denied the allegations. He believed that Candace had broken into his house, taken a used item from the trash in his basement, and used the bodily fluid to make false accusations. He claimed she wanted to set him up to blackmail him and get money. When he realized what was happening, he took strong actions to defend himself, safeguard his family, and protect his reputation in the community. By strong actions, he meant manipulation of evidence. Even after his confession, nobody could figure out how he'd done it. Soon, the long-awaited moment finally arrived. Dr. John was called upon to explain how he manipulated the DNA evidence. The events that took place during this crime were truly shocking and left a lasting impact on the public. But the real shocker was yet to come when his desperate scheme finally came to light. After the first blood sample request in 1992, Dr. John had surgically inserted a tube, a 15-centimeter Penrose drain filled with another man's blood into his arm, alongside his actual vein. He'd also added anticoagulants to keep the blood fluid. When he was taken to the police lab for testing, he orchestrated the situation so that the technician drew blood from the tube instead of his actual vein. After the test, he removed the tube. He repeated this process nine months later for the second test. In April 1996, upon learning that Candace had hired an investigator, he reinserted the tube. This could explain why the nurse thought the blood seemed old. It actually was as much as seven months old and belonged to one of his male patients, Danny Sabo. Upon reviewing the video recording, investigators noticed the way Dr. John had manipulated things. He consistently offered his left arm and rolled up his sleeve just above the elbow, hiding the scar from where he'd cut himself to insert the tube. In the video, there's a brief instance where you can catch a glimpse of the raised skin shaped like a tube. Candace took the spotlight as the key witness. After so many years, her voice was finally heard and respected. The defense attempted to paint her as someone seeking money and a fabricator of lies, but she didn't let that fly. Determinous ever, she emphasized that she had no ulterior motives for pursuing the truth about the doctor all those years. The defense claimed that Candace's memory of the crime was distorted due to the sedatives she'd been given. Candace confronted John's lawyer and said, We'll drug you on Versity and you can explain to us how it feels. It took seven years before Dr. John Schieberger was finally found guilty of assault, administering a noxious substance, as well as the obstruction of justice. He was sentenced to six years in prison for these offenses. The maximum penalty for these offenses were typically life imprisonment, so he got off very lightly. Besides, he wasn't convicted for the assault of his stepdaughter, as there was not enough conclusive evidence. Still, Candace Finige felt vindicated. After the trial, she said, This is a glorious day that I've waited for for seven years. I hope he rots because that's exactly what he deserves for all the hurt caused. If you found this helpful, please click the thumbs up button and subscribe to catch more videos. You may also leave any questions or suggestions you'd like to see me cover in future videos in the comments section.